Good day, everyone. I think we can start. Welcome to the webinar, the last webinar for 2020, The Future World of Work. It's great to see all of you, and I'm sure a lot of people will still join. Um, you will see that your current microphone setting is on mute. It will remain like that for the duration of the webinar, just to avoid any background noises and to make sure that everybody can listen to the presenter. My name is Lizette de Villiers. I will be your host today, and the presenter is Peter de Villiers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Peter, most of you know him very well. He's the author and functional developer of the Shadow Match system. He's also the initiator and part of the development team who developed Next Move 4.0, of which you will hear a little bit later. Um, Peter also authored future books. He authored this book on Face the Future 10 years ago. Unfortunately, it's not currently available anymore any longer. And he was also co-author of the book Future Business, The Game Has Changed. And this book will soon be available on Amazon. So you can watch the space and you will be able to buy this book online. We do still have some hard copies left. So if you are really interested, you can just send us an email to info at shadowmatch.co.za and we can then let you get a copy of the book. Um, so Peter doesn't need any more introduction. Peter, we're looking forward to the webinar. Thank you very much and over to you. Thank you, Lizette. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the last Shadow Match driven we um, webinar of the year. The next ones will be in January, but we are taking a break. Um, it's end of year and it's a year that we don't want to repeat, not for ourselves and not for our enemies. So um, welcome to this last one. And uh, I hope that you will learn a lot of new stuff from the content. And uh, I've changed it. It's the second uh, fourth industrial revolution webinar that we host. And the reason for this is just because of the interest and uh, and the interest is such that we can we can actually change the content and run a webinar like this every month and, and the, the content can continuously change and nobody will become frustrated with the with with what we what we discuss. Um, this afternoon, what we will do is um, I will give you a very brief overview of how this is a threat um, to the world of work and the world of business and but also an opportunity at the same time. Um, and I want to just at an, at an initial level say that some of the slides are very ugly, but it's the best that I could do with my limited skills. Um, but they will bring the point and I will take you through them as, be, as, as good as I can. Um, so we will get a bit of an overview and then a few practical things in terms of practical tips that we should take uh, very serious uh, in, a in a time of this, this industrial revolution and this quiet sort of changing agent in the world. And some of the information obviously will be new. But what I want you to do is, I want you to during this holiday season, whilst we have a lot of conversations with friends and family and we have get togethers. And if there's no topic for you to discuss, start talking about um, a bank with no employees. Would you mind banking at an institution, a banking institution where there's no, there's, there, there are no employees that you could engage. Everything is either on your phone or on your laptop or on your screen or whatever device you use. And you cannot talk to anybody. You cannot phone and say, I'm struggling. And, and then listen to the conversation. Or would you uh, do financial um, investments at an institution where there's nobody? There's nobody that would talk to you, nobody that would answer your questions. There is no street address, there's nothing, there's nothing. There's a website and you put your money via the internet on a website and you manage everything yourself. And you don't, if you don't get it right tough, then, then it's then tough luck, you, you don't get it right. So this is where we, where we must get our minds, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that in the world of the future business, and I will give you a few examples. Um, this is the automation level is going to change the world, but in, in, in a radical and in a dramatical way. On the 28th of October this year, one of the leading banks in South Africa announced then they, they will lay off 25 to 30% of their workforce. Um, but they will not, they, their customer base will grow and their service offering to their customers will still increase. But they lay off, they retrench, 
between 25 and 30 percent of their workforce. How do they do that? They said in the in the announcement, they said this is as a result of COVID-19, which I didn't get. And then I listened to the rest of the announcement and they said that automation made it possible for us to, um, to retrench and, and in this way run a bank that is more cost efficient. That's the point. The point that I want to make is how can a big business with hundreds of thousands of clients lay off 25 to 30 percent of their workforce without dropping the ball. There's only one way, and that is you've got to automate it. And this is what this is what we need to understand. We need to understand that this predicament is a growing one, and it's a reality that we will have to face. I'm going to share my screen and show you a few points that we can discuss and then it makes the focus on the content a bit easier. We live in a time of a classic catch-22 situation. Everybody, and if you discuss these topics of, I will show you a few publications at the end of our uh, webinar that I suggest if you are interested, you should get your hands on and read it. Um, I always say to myself, there's a difference between buying a book and actually reading it. Um, we all know that we, must, that, that we must actually stop this process because what are we going to do in a society where there, is no, where there is no employment? We know that we must stop it, but we also know that we can't stop it. We won't be able to stop it. So we would rather, we should rather try our best as individuals and as business owners and as entrepreneurs, employees, to embrace this change. So this is the question that, 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 I, that I put across to you a few moments ago. How do you retrench 30% of your workforce, grow your customer base and increase your service offering without dropping the ball? This is what's happening. I read an article that any big bank in South Africa can take over any other bank without taking their employees with them. It's just a migration of data. And if the automation is to a level where they are capable of offering all the services, they don't have to take one employee with, with a takeover. How do you do it? You automate the process. You automate the capabilities of the process and you add artificial intelligence to your platforms and there is no limit to the number of customers that you can handle. So with that in mind, knowing that we should actually stop this, but we won't be able, we need to embrace it. And, and, and the way that we embrace this is through a process of automation. We need to understand a few basic things. The progress of intelligent systems, um, where are we and where are we going with the development of intelligent systems, um, which is obviously on the one side an adventurous uh, development, on the other it's something to really admire, and on a third level it's something to fear, but on a fourth level it's something if you use it in your favor, the opportunities of your personal position in business is for all practical reasons beyond limitations. And then any global crisis accelerates this process. Now, this is something very interesting um, that, that never came to mind in my world of understanding uh, the world of industry four and the future world of business and work. And that is that any global crisis accelerates the automation process. And Whatever the crisis is, if there's a labor strike in a certain sector of business, what do they do? The people behind, the people behind, the people behind say, how do, you, how do we deal with these labor strikes? Um, we, re, we get rid of them. How do we get rid of them? We automate what they do. So any big crisis accelerates the process of automation. As we have seen with, with, with COVID-19 and what the pandemic caused, it was a global crisis. And it is anticipated that it accelerated the process of automation with 10 years. So in seven months time, the process 
pace of automation has been accelerated into the future with 10 years. This is quite shocking because what happened was that in one year, we moved as, as a result of a crisis 10 years forward. In the normal run of the mill, it would have taken 10 years for companies to work remotely, to have a culture of remote work, to have all people uh, facilitate all their meetings via Zoom, Skype, uh, whatever it might be, uh, uh, Teams, Google uh, 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 um, Hangouts or whatever it is. But suddenly, because there's a crisis, this entire process has been accelerated uh, over a very short period of time. And the same happened with a, with, with, with a war, uh, a tension between uh, um, uh, countries and governments. Um, in the United States currently, this process of, of, of vote recounting, what they reckon is that the next voting system, you will register the voter with his cell phone as one unit. So the cell phone and the voting entity will become one unit. And then your fingerprint on the cell phone plus the, the authentication of the phone and your identity will become your voting ticket. And the system will be, will be run by three different platforms of voting count systems so that they audit one another. So a crisis in America has changed the way in which democracy works. So any crisis accelerates the process. And this is what we need to understand. And then I want to show you on a, on, a, on a different level how it happened that we are very worried about the future of work. Now, ladies and gentlemen, many years ago, long, long ago, when the trees could still walk around and the animals could talk, well, not that long ago, um, all work, all work had to be done by the human hand and the human brain. Sometimes we had help from horses. Sometimes we had help from other animals, but 99% of all work had to be done by hand, and it's been done by the thinking capability of the human brain. And then suddenly, a few years ago, well, many years ago, but in the bigger scheme of things, a few years ago, we discovered the, the breakthrough through was mechanical power. The steam engine, very shortly after that, well, not that very shortly after that, but after that came the, the gasoline, petrol and diesel engines, and then electricity as a mechanical power plant. And this, this made a huge difference between, because some of these hands and horses could now be replaced by machines that, that, that generate the energy and the power that we need to do the big things. So what happened is mechanical breakthroughs took one hand out of the equation, but I still needed the brains and the hands to manage and drive and operate these machines. Good. We were still safe. Everything was fine. But then many years later, we discovered something else, the computer system. Now another hand has disappeared, but nothing has been done to the brain power necessary to do the work. These machines had to be programmed, software programs, da, 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 everything had to be done. And they had to be operated by hand and thinking capabilities of intelligent people with the capabilities to run them and to work them. But then came the change. Now what happened is you will see we've lost one hand uh, from there to there, we've lost another hand from there to here. And suddenly, when these machines were capable of running these mechanical systems, this is what happened. The intelligence of the computers were used, and the, the technical work is by means of control systems. The capabilities of the computers were used to run the mechanical operations of, 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 of the power engines. And then what happened is we started to have mechanical things being operated by artificial intelligent control and control systems. 
So the mechanics of the world, where things were had to be done by mechanical operations, were now controlled by computers. And suddenly the space of the human hand and the human brain has been seriously threatened and challenged. Suddenly, it is the space of work for the human hand, the physical capabilities of, the, of, 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 of people, and the thinking capabilities of people are under threat. And this is where we are, we are currently in the midst of this process, where the space, where, where the hand of the, the human person and the intelligence of the human person is under threat. And this is by this space, this space of people thinking and doing, this space shrinks. So, and it's been threatened by the, 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 the development of these systems where mechanical things, the things we had, we needed physical labor for, the hand of a human is now being controlled not by the brain of the human, but by an artificial intelligent control system. Now, suddenly, the game has seriously changed. And suddenly, what we are working, living towards is that we have a world of unemployed people. The unemployment rate in the world currently is the highest that it's ever been. In South Africa, the numbers are a bit different. It all depends on who report on the numbers. But the best numbers are those that come from government. They sit somewhere in the high 30s. Um, and then we have the labor units. They make it the high 40s. And then we have the independent research agents. They make it in the mid 50s. And then we have business that could bring it up to about 60 to 63 percent unemployment it all depends on how you look at the numbers numbers are very um we can manipulate numbers a bit but in america because of this crisis that accelerated the artificial intelligent control system deployment in the country suddenly the unemployment is the highest it's been for many years and the anticipated problem is it won't improve and it won't get better very easily so this is the challenge that we live with and that is that that the the, the capabilities of the the control system and artificial intelligence system poses a threat to the work being done by people and the human brain obviously behind 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 the scenes there are clever people manufacturing and building these systems but they are just a very small percentage of society. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the book that Lizette showed you uh, is a book that I wrote in 2010. It was published in 2010. I wrote it in 29, uh, 2009. Uh, the title of the book is Face the Future, but as Lizette rightly said, the book is not available in the market anymore. So if anybody wants one, it must be printed. And that is quite an expensive exercise to print a single book. But on page 100, 134, I anticipated something to happen with society. And this is the picture that was published on page 134. And I want to go through this picture with you because um, it is a bit of a scary picture. On the top, what we have is the heading is society in the good old days. We had a triangle, a distribution of income and a distribution of wealth. The rich, the, the rich people of the world were the top, the top part of this triangle, that top part were the, the rich people. And then we had quite a large portion of the middle class where the working individuals, they, they had a good income, they had a good salary, they could afford a car and a house and their children, their children could go to school and they, they could put food on the table, blah, 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 everything that the middle income person would have uh, 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 available for themselves and their families. And then at the bottom here, we had a quite a, an extensive uh, portion of the triangle of the poor people. But remember, these were not the unemployed poor. They were just on the bottom end of the income 
a, a, a triangle of society. So they they were very low end, entry level people working as in the in the factory, working in the garden, working in on farms, working the, the hard labor, sort of the blue collar, and I don't like the work word. I, I think it's a bit discrimination, um, but but the blue collar worker is a known term all over the world. They did physical work and their income were on the lower end of the income triangle of the good old days. I don't think these were the best days, but it, it, it worked. What I anticipated to happen when I wrote the book during my research is that this middle portion will collapse. That midsection there will collapse. This middle section of society will drastically shrink. And I anticipated that as this middle portion of society shrinks, we will work towards a society that will increasingly look like this. We will have the rich, the middle will be very thin. This will be a very thin, and a, uh, in terms of numbers, it will be a selected few in society that will do the high-end work in their service to the rich, obviously. They will build the system. These people will build the systems that will feed money up this, this, this uh, frame into the pockets of the wealthy and the governments of the world. And then at the bottom, we will have an inflated bottom of poor people unemployed. This is what I anticipated in 2010 when I published the book. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the sad news is we are here now. This is exactly where we are. Within 10 years, this thing became a reality. And, and what I anticipated, and if you read the book, I. I actually expressed my fear that this, this, is, this is not something that we can stop. How was it possible to anticipate this 10 years ago? It was I realized that artificial intelligence systems will replace the work these people do. It will start to penetrate the world, these, the work these people do. And this entire employment part of this triangle, that big portion, will collapse and it'll become automated and we will have a middle class that is employed to build these intelligent systems and an inflated bottom end that is unemployed slash very poor. So how now? What, what, what now? What, we, what do we do? This, this, this is what we anticipated and this is what is happening. And it's in many instances, it's already happened. So the problem is how do we go forward with this? Because this process, the, 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 the process of moving from here to there will now suddenly increase at a very uh, a, a rapid pace and, 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 and the numbers will inflate itself of poor people and unemployed people. So what we anticipate uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that we need to we need a personal plan. Everybody must have sort of a personal plan. And I want to give you 10 tips, but just before we start running down these 10 tips, because I will say something about each one of them. The future world, there will be lots of opportunities and there will be lots of jobs, many, many but the unemployment will be right through the ceiling. So there will be lots of jobs, but there won't be people with the skills to take up the jobs. This is the problem. The problem is that the future world of work will need somebody with different skills from what we currently have in society and in business as available skills pool in the community. The youngsters that leave school today, how do they get into the process of working at the top end of an artificial intelligent development engine? So in other words, if you grow up there, how do you get into this process there where you work as a highly specialized individual capable of, of designing and building and 
and running businesses that 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 where where, where machines and systems run run the operations. So there will be lots of jobs. There will be massive opportunities. But the number of people with the, with the skills and the knowledge to take these jobs will be extremely limited. And that's why some of these skills are in such high demand, but the number of people with those skills are not, they're not there. They are just not there because our training institutions have, have been caught off balance by the speed at which industry four and the fourth industrial revolution penetrated the world of business and work. So the speed at which things happened just caught everybody off balance and the training institutions, the schools, universities, colleges just couldn't catch up in the training and the, the curriculum design of the training content with a need of business to employ these, these highly skilled um, uh, individuals to run, to run the platforms. So what they do is they just automate it more and more and more and more. And they make the systems cleverer and more intelligent, more smart, so that they don't need people anymore so that they could reduce their dependency on the human hand and brain. So if I would give myself 10 tips, um, ladies and gentlemen, and I take a very responsible approach to this, and I say to myself, what are the 10 tips that I can give an individual in these times to really, really take a mature and a responsible approach towards their business, their service offering if they run a business, and their employment if they are employed by big companies. These are the 10 tips that I would give myself and my friends around the table. The first is research the future of your career. Google your career slash industry for developments. So if you are whatever your career is, if you are a teacher, Google teachers in the industry in, in a fourth industrial revolution. If you are a lecturer, if you are a dentist, a pilot, a consultant, whatever it is, Google the future of this job that I'm doing and industry in, in the fourth industrial revolution. Try to determine what is happening in your career. Try to determine where is the world going with the job that I'm currently doing, because you don't want to reach a point where you, where you discover the fact that I'm, known, I, I'm not necessary anymore. And I'm now in a position that nobody needs me because my job has been made redundant by artificial systems. The second point is research the fu future of your, your employment. So the current job that you are doing, ask yourself the honest question, if you are, especially if you are in a big business, smaller companies with employment less than 30 people, it's not so critical. It's not because the small companies are very dependent on each one of their employees. And that's why they are, they are limited in their number of employees. But if you work for a big corporate, ask yourself the question, what will happen if I'm not here? If I'm not here for six weeks, what will happen to the business? Not to my division or not to my team or not to my office. What will happen to the business if I'm not here for six to 10 weeks? If you come to the conclusion, nothing will happen. Be careful. Be careful. Your, your job is at risk because if the CEO of the company needs to decide who must go as a result of automation that made positions redundant and you are not critical to the business, you might be on the next retrenchment list. Then research the future of your business. If you work for a bank, an, an investment corporation, a cell, a cell phone company, a telecom, an internet company, a technical company, whatever it is, Research the future of that business and ask yourself, where will this business go 
with the development of technology in the next 10 years. Let me give you an example. Let's take a very, very easy to understand example. Let's say, for instance, I run a car wash business. I have a washing bay where 30 people can park. I have 10 people working for me. We wash a car, a car in every 20 minutes and I do 20 cars a day or 30 cars or 50 cars a day. Research, the fourth industrial revolution for car washing. You will find out that in two or three years from now, there will be nobody employed. It will be a completely automated systems, system. So research the future of the business that you are in, that you are either in as, a, as an employee or as a business owner slash entrepreneur. Then on a personal, very personal note, um, ladies and gentlemen, I will send you an article and I'm, I'm not sure whether Marcel Hatton joined us on uh, around the table, but if he joined, uh, thanks Marcel for a very, very insightful article that he sent me. I was fascinated by the content and in his absence, I think he's not here, but in his absence, thanks Marcel. Um, which I will send to you that it's got 365 jobs listed. And then the probability of those jobs to be replaced by artificial intelligence systems. I will send it to you. All the people in the room currently will get a copy as well as a copy of a micro book that I wrote on Industry 4. The point is the people that will stop studying, stop learning, and stop to upskill themselves will be the first ones to join the bag of unemployment. We cannot afford this. We must continuously study, learn, upskill. Study, learn, upskill. Study, learn, upskill. I cannot say this enough. You cannot in this crisis of, or this in, in this time frame of the world, which I don't think is that much of a crisis. For many people, it will become a crisis. But in this context, context we cannot stop studying, learning, and upskilling ourselves. Then and some piece of advice um, that I always had for myself and everybody that I engaged is, you must have a plan B. You must have a plan B as an alternative, even if it's a hobby now, but you must be able to turn plan B into an income generating alternative. If plan B is to service bicycles, keeping the bicycle market and service bicycles as a, as a hobby, because you might just need it. It doesn't matter what plan B is. You can have a photography hobby and turn it into a business if you need it but you must have a plan B as an alternative because we live in very uncertain times. And then ladies and gentlemen, just plan. We must just plan, we must plan. We must plan our careers. We must ask ourselves, where am I going with my career? And in some instances, we need a professional career coach to take us through the process of planning because I've just, had a meeting this morning with somebody who said that he's helping somebody he knows very well and if somebody doesn't help that individual and help that individual to plan and move forward nothing will happen and I'm not saying we are like that but having somebody to plan with me and move with me in this in this answer in these uncertain times is just to enrich the plan that I have for my future to a level where I can be quite certain that 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 I will be okay and then build a network of associations. I'm very convinced, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that our networks will be our surviving tools going into the future. The networks that we have of, of people that we have as, as, as good connections, uh, good relationship, positive relationships are extremely valuable because it is within the network that we can sell our skills and get a level of security for business, for growth, et cetera, et cetera. I am extremely aware of the value of networks around individuals and, and businesses. And we must work on those networks and bring these networks together 
so that networks could feed off each other. How does a network work? Let me give you an example. I'm a lawyer and I have 250 customers. And uh, a very good friend of mine, he uh, become, he be, he's, he's retrenched and he is out of work. And um, the family, the husband and wife start a business of delivering food to people at home, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I take that service of a friend and I send an email to my network and I say, um, this is somebody that I can recommend if you have a need for, for, for this service offering, please contact them at this and this and this uh, uh, contact with these and uh, contact detail. So what I do is I introduce somebody to my network. If that couple has the opportunity to be introduced to five or six networks like this, their, businesses, their business can, can take off and fly and, and be sustainable. Because tomorrow I might need a network from from them because they are in the meantime building a network of people to whom they deliver food and i might be, need a network to promote something because my business became threatened as a result of some crisis so network associations i believe is one of the most powerful things that we need to build for ourselves as individuals but also for our businesses then if possible become a specialist now, ladies and gentlemen, this is quite important. Um, in the world of the future, the most sustainable jobs are those that are built around individuals that are highly specialized people. If it is at all possible, try to become a specialist. It doesn't matter what specialist it is. If you become a sewing machine service mechanic, become one of the best in the country. If you, whatever it is, just become some form of a specialist so that networks could recommend your service as a specialist within their networks. And this is an absolute critical point for the individual to be, to be as much of a specialist that you can be. And then expect radical change and be prepared. Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't think for one moment that the crisis that was announced with the announcement of the virus is the last one. Um, don't for one moment think that these unexpected and radical changes in our world will not happen. It will happen to a much deeper level. It will happen uh, with higher levels of frequency and it will happen with a more radical impact on our world of work and, and living spaces. So we must live, we must be aware of the fact that things can change for me or against me very quickly. And then obviously, the last point on the 10 tips that I would like to share with you is don't plan to retire. It's not working. 90% of individuals that worked for 40 years will not will outlive their savings. There's no question about it. And what then? It's bad to be out of money when you are 50. Do you have an idea how bad it is if you are 80? Um, or 90. And the life expectancy of people because of medicine and the treatment that we have available is currently edging 100 years. So we must get this retirement idea out of our minds. We must be in a position to stay and remain a high level of productivity for as long as we can. It doesn't have to be full time but you must generate an income for as long as it is possible. Right, so how can we help you? Ladies and gentlemen, we have two systems, obviously. Uh, Shadow Match uh, provides people with an industry four career guidance report. It's the only one in the world that is industry four enabled and ready, and it talks the language of the fourth industrial revolution in terms of workspace and workplace. 
where your optimal workspaces will be and where, where it will be the easiest for you to fit into a specific industry job or capability uh, in, the, in the future world of work based on your habits. And this career report is available at www.careermatchforme.com or you can send an email to info at shadowmatch.com and we will give you all the information that you need. But we also run a, a second software uh, platform, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the name of the system is Next Move, and the website is gonextmove.com. It's an AI system to analyze the industry for in this, in IR4, uh, Industrial Revolution Number Four, readiness of your business. Um, if you work in a company and you would like to know what is the fourth industrial revolution readiness of that business to survive the, the challenges of automation and the future reality of business. Um, just send an email to info at shadowmatch.com uh, and, uh, and, 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 and say to us that you are interested in a next move for your business. And we will be more than willing to do an analysis of your business to see where are the holding and the sticking points uh, uh, that will hold the business back in terms of uh, competition going into the future, given the automation of, of business capabilities and business platforms. But what I want to do, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to a few books. The one, uh, the first and the second book, both authored by the same person, Jeremy Rifkin. Now, what he did is he wrote a book on marginal cost society. And this is quite a scary, well, both these books are quite scary to read. It is, the information in, in, in these books are shocking. But in marginal, the Marginal Cost Society, Zero Marginal Cost Society is a book where Jeremy argues that we are moving into a world where things will cost nothing um, or almost nothing. Um, it will be the cost of services and the cost of things will have to be almost nothing just to make it available to everybody. But the point is, there will also zero marginal income. So it's quite a scary book to read. I think it's a very good book. It's very balanced. It's very honest. And on the right of your screen, the end of work. This book, um, anticipates the decline of the global force and the dawn of the post-market era. This book, ladies and gentlemen, and it's where a lot of the modern business thinkers the like Elon Musk and, 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 and there are many of them are currently where they anticipate a world where there won't be work. They were, people will be unemployed. In some countries, in, in Scandinavian countries, and even in, in some, well, other European countries as well, being unemployed is normal. The government gives me a subsidy and I can actually live a respected life with a subsidy that I get from the government. And being unemployed is normal. There's nothing strange about it. Why? Because they are no work. They, they, work has ended for those people. And it's, there's no... There's no sense in trying to find a job. There is nothing. So unemployed is part of the culture of society. Now, what happens if this becomes a global uh, reality? Then we need an income. And Elon Musk is of opinion that we must move towards a society where everybody on the planet has a basic respectable income. So how do we do it? Jeremy is of opinion they, they, they must be uh, there must be an extreme level of shared um, wealth uh, in, the, in the future world to, to carry this end of work scenario that he anticipates. It's a very good book. It's a good read. It's well, well, money well spent. But then, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to send you an article or the office, the Shadow Match office. Um, I think Shemaine will probably do it. Lizette, am I right? Yeah, Shemaine will send you an email with two attachments. The one is a micro book that I wrote on the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, the other one is an abstract from this book that is currently on your screen. AI superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the new world order by Kai Fu Li. This is 
this is quite a, a read, ladies and gentlemen. It's very fresh. It's just off the press. Um, it's very new, but it's a powerful publication about the impact that, that artificial intelligence will have, especially from the Chinese um, development perspective. Where, where he anticipates that nobody in the world will be able to compete in terms of a cost of manufacture with the Chinese because of the automation level. And this is why um, if you buy the, some of the top end golf clubs currently in the world, they manufacture in China, buy one of the top end watches in the world, they manufactured in China with, with, with robotics, with artificial intelligent control systems and robotics. So this is, this is a shocking book to read, but I will send you an abstract article from that, that refers to the information of this book. I wanna share something with you. In the article that I will send you, there is a list of 365 jobs and the probability of those jobs to be automated within the next 15 years, 10 to 15 years. Now, keep in mind that since this article was published, the coronavirus accelerated us probably with 10 years into this, into this paradigm, and we will feel it within the next 18 months. I want to highlight a few of these, ladies and gentlemen, the ones in red. Legal associate professional. I just want to, this is just an abstract from the article that I will send to you. But the people who put this list together are extremely credible, ladies and gentlemen. PwC is amongst the research agents, da, 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 da. It's very credible work that's being done by a very conservative research engine. So this is conservative judgments. Legal associate professor, prof professional, 79% chance of being completely automated by within the next 15 years. Let's have a ne the next one is a medical and dental technician, 81%. Finance and investment analyst, 82%. Then we move into the, into the 90%. Now, these are easy to understand. Translators, interpreters, we are almost 90%. They're already clerical, retail, cashier, and checkout operator, customer service representative, pharmaceutical technician. This is already a graduated person. It's already a person with a quality, with a, a relatively high level qualification. Plant and machine operator that we can understand, assembler, putting things together that we can understand, automate with robotics. Library clerk, mm, yeah, that's easy to automate. It's not a problem. Warehouse worker, 90%. But now have a look at the, these are without question, they will be automated. Financial and accounting. Bank and post office clerk slash teller. Clerical finance, financial administrative worker, clerical bookkeeper, payroll manager, telephone salesperson, telemarketing, 99%. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is, you will see it in the article and you will also see the content of the article. And there are a few paragraphs in this article that I would like you to give special attention to. The one is about continuous learning self-learning, self-development, and skills development so that we can become specialized individuals. So with that in mind, um, what I suggest is have, a dis have discussions with family and friends around this topic, and you will immediately be aware of something very interesting. The discussion becomes tense every time. You will see that there is a tension around this. If you say to an architect, do you know that your job is in the process of being replaced by an AI system where a child can draw any building and get it approved through the city council of the international big cities without a problem? They immediately are on the back foot and they are immediately in defense mode. I understand that. The problem is not going to go away because we defend our arguments. The problem will not disappear because we have good arguments. This, and you will immediately see how people become, they, they, they feel pushed back. So with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, I at my advice are listed on the 10 tips. 
Um, we will send you a, a copy of this recording. We will send you a copy of the book that I just published, the micro book, as well as the article that Marcel shared with me, which I think is an excellent, it's a fantastic piece of read. It's about a 10 minute read, make it 15 minutes, 20 minutes, if you want to think about it as well. And uh, with that in mind, I think we need to take action. And I th think the three actions that we need to take is we need to build networks, um, we need to upskill ourselves, and we need, we need to have a career and, and, and development plan so that we are not being forced into a situation where we need to play catch up uh, uh, in terms of our business, the sustainability of our business, our careers and our jobs. With that, thank you very much for joining. And if there are any questions, I'm more than willing to try and deal with it as best as I can. Back to you, Lizzie. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much for an insightful webinar. The slides were beautiful. So thank you very much. I think everybody enjoyed it. And it was very good information, good content. And we will arrange with Charmaine to send the book and the article to everybody by tomorrow morning. You will receive it during the course of tomorrow morning. Peter, there was one or two questions. I'm just gonna allow everybody to unmute themselves. And um, Melt has a question. So I'm gonna allow Melt to go first. Melt, just give me a moment um, just to check all my settings. You should be able to unmute yourself, Mel, and then you can ask your question. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the information. And thanks for the, the webinar. Uh, my question is, uh, Peter, I would like to know, what is your view on self-sustainable living? And there's a worldwide movement. Uh, it's commonly called homesteading. I'd like to know your view on it. Um, Mel, I think it's not, a, it's not something that we need to argue anymore. I think everybody that can, and if you have a, a space where you can set up a sustainable and a self-sustained um, lifestyle where you produce and, 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 and have a bartered systems with your neighbors and your environment um, for value, and, and I have food and you have this and we, we change. I think the drive of, of, of the self-sustained lifestyle is because we anticipate a world of trouble. We anticipate a world of unemployment. And, and this is how the individual and the in innovation of the individual came into operation to say, but if this is going to happen, I must be able to live a meaningful life and sustain my own livelihood independently. I must have water, energy, and food. So, so this is something that I'm extremely positive about. I am willing to invest time and energy to help people get into a sustainable, self-sustainable lifestyle. And I think we, everybody must have a plan to at least um, survive if, if unemployment becomes the norm. Uh, so I'm extremely positive about it. And I think we need a lot of energy to push this forward and to accelerate the process. Thank you. Um, if uh, I would like to have a, a second question, if it's possible. Um, okay, uh, we're going to, through a, a stage of um, change. Uh, and what is your view on unrest and safety and security for the interim? And where do you think we'll end up? Crime will be the biggest problem to deal with in the future world of unemployment because the have-nots will always want what they have. Um, have and and crime will be a way of of doing with it. There are some cultures in the world, Melt, and obviously it's out of South Africa. It's not inside South Africa. So um, bear with me for a second. Where parents actually teach their children how to steal, mm -hmm. they teach them at a very young age how to steal and where to steal without uh, uh, the risk of being caught. Um, so crime will be a huge problem and safety will be a problem. And that's why we need to build networks so that networks uh, could come together and look, look after each other and create communities of, of, of co-caring. And this is the new word that I see that's being used very often is communities of co-caring, where, where the community takes co-responsibility 
within that community of each other and of the safety and, and the threat of crime. But crime will not only stay at the point of stealing a bicycle across the fence. Um, it's a highly sophisticated crime from the unemployed into the banking systems and into IT platforms and hacking and that will also be on the increase. So it's a huge problem and the only way that we could prevent this from destroying the process further is we must create co-caring communities so that we can look after each other. There's no other way, but crime will be the biggest challenge. Thank you. Thanks, Melv. Any other questions, Lizette? Um, thanks, Melv. Thanks, Peter. If you can just mute yourselves, otherwise I know on the recording it switches between all the faces and it can, can be quite a disturbance. Thanks. There was a question from, I think it is um, Lynette. Let me just open that or Lynn, Lynn Brooks. Um, I think there was maybe some auto corrections on the typing, but Lynn said, why do we need to upskill if there will be a living, I guess, subsidy paid? Um, Lynn, if I'm not verbalizing your question correctly, you can maybe just unmute yourself and ask. But Peter, over to you if you want to comment on that. Yeah, Lizette, um, there's, a, there's a fabulous um, YouTube video uh, about Elon Musk talking uh, to a, a reporter on the future of, of employment. And Musk is of opinion that the wealthy companies must structure themselves in such a way that the money they make are being distributed amongst their clients so that they can buy the products that, that they manufacture. Um, the question now, if, if we are all going to get a minimum wage, the problem is in poor countries, the minimum income that will be given to everybody will be such that it, you cannot make a decent, you cannot live a decent living from that. So in poor countries like South Africa and Africa and, and, and all the, the, the Indias and, and those countries where, where the income is just not there, um, it will not be possible to give everybody a livable, respectful income. In the very wealthy countries like Germany, and, and the Netherlands and those countries, it's a different, it's, it's different. And, and the, the income of, and the, the wealth of the country is such that they can sustain. You know, for instance, in Russia, um, a young family don't need to work because they get, a, they, get, they get a flat, they get two bedrooms, they get three bedrooms. If they have a second child, they get energy for free. But the Russian government generate so much money from their oil and gas resources all over the world that they distribute that they can use the money to give an, a, a decent income to their people. But in Africa, that doesn't happen. Obviously, for two reasons, we don't have those resources and our governments don't tend to keep the money for the people, but for themselves. So um, there's a, it's a huge challenge. The only reason why we need to upskill is so that we have a, a chance of being a specialist in this in the specialized field of expertise, and there will always be a need for the service of a highly specialized individual. It doesn't matter what it is, if it's watchmaking or pottery or whatever it is, I can I can always make and be referred to by other people as one of the specialists. And if I'm, I'm in a business. The question is, what will happen to the business if I'm not here? The answer is nothing. We are in trouble. But if I'm up, if I'm highly skilled and a crit critical uh, a resource in the business, my risk obviously is much less of becoming unemployed and retrenched. And this is, this is the broad lines of answering the question. Thank you very much, Peter, and there's a thank you very much from Lynn as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please don't run away. I'm just going to stop the recording for the purpose of keeping it within an hour for those that want to listen to it later. Thank you very much for attending. I hope that you will have a wonderful day. I'm going to stop the recording and then I'm going to open the floor for further discussion. Thanks. <laughs>